Thank you very much. All right, so what I want to do today is describe uh, what's going on with the, the Manatee Project. Some of you may be aware that this has been going on for several years now. Some of you may have participated as uh, volunteers in this project. And this is kind of an update. We can now talk about what's been happening in the last six years since this project got started. But before we begin with that, I'll just sort of bring you up to speed on uh, manatees themselves. They're part of the mammalian order Serenia. And Serenia are most closely related to elephants. And so we call these sea cows, but they're actually underwater elephants. The subspecies here in Florida is largely restricted to just Florida. There are occasional tagged individuals that have shown up in the Bahamas or in Cuba, but mostly they are in Florida. And they're native to Florida. You can find manatee uh, skulls and other skeletal material in uh, Paleo-Indian middens, pre-Columbian. And since 67, they've been listed under one of the early versions of the Endangered Species Act because they had been overhunted and overfished so significantly that their numbers were down below 1,000 individuals. Uh, they're vulnerable for a number of reasons, one of which is that there aren't just that many of them. And secondly, they have very low reproductive replacement rates. So typically, a female produces one calf every two years. They're also thermally restricted to just Florida waters and only portions of Florida during the colder months. And then there are some human-related issues that I'll get into in a little bit. As far as their physiology goes, they have one of the lowest metabolisms of any placental mammals. And so that means that you know, their heartbeats are at a much lower rate. Uh, body temperatures, as you can see, are much lower than, than say, you. Um, and they have very little tolerance for cold temperatures. They look really big and blubbery, but they're not. They're actually mostly composed of muscle and intestines. As herbivores, they have to eat tremendous amounts of vegetable matter in order to get the nutrition they need to support a really large body. And so that means they're eating large masses of, of plant matter. And when water temperatures get below 68 degrees, they start to show what's called cold stress syndrome. And this includes a number of things like these white patches you see um, uh, along the edges of the scratches and just patches on the body. And this is skin that's actually sloughing off as a result of uh, the cold stress of being in water too cold. And that was, this was an individual earlier this uh, year, a uh, little calf that was uh, following its mom and uh, clearly showing signs of cold stress. Anatomically, there's some very interesting things about manatees. They're big. Everybody knows that. The average is about 10 feet and 1,000 pounds. But females get bigger. And so they can be up to 13 feet and 3,000 pounds. Um, they swim generally fairly slowly, only a few miles an hour. But they're capable of doing burst speeds to get out of dangerous situations or to evade predators. So they can get up to 20 miles an hour. That's pretty good when you're talking about a half ton moving through the water. The skin is really, really thick. Remember, they're related to elephants, which we sometimes call pachyderms. Pachyderm just means thick skin. And this is a feature they share in common with that uh, relatedness to elephants. Two inches thick, which on one hand is a protection against things like boat strikes and propellers and, and such. But it wasn't adapted for that. It was adapted for being able to rub up against uh, oyster reefs and oysters and, and you know, still sustain cuts, but not cuts that go all the way into the musculature. Uh, the skin sometimes features things like uh, clumps of macroalgae. They'll get filamentous green or, or red or brown algaes on them, or barnacles if uh, individuals are spending more time in nearly fully marine waters. But there's still a lot we don't know about manatees. And so we actually don't even know how old they can get. We know there's an individual down in Miami called Snooty, and he was first retrieved as a calf. And so we know he's almost 60 years old. But who knows how old they get? So this is what, you know, just part of the information we're trying to gather. 
as far as conservation issues, there's a number of issues that they're dealing with, one of which is watercraft accidents. Uh, this is a, a leading cause of death in manatees annually. The average is typically around 80 to 90 individuals being now killed by water uh, crafts or boat strikes, um, and many, many hundreds more being injured in sublethal ways. Uh, floodgates and navigation locks have been known to crush manatees as they're closing, and so one thing that Harbor Branch has been doing, the engineering group, is building sensors that allow for gates and navigation locks to stop closing when a manatee passes through the sensor. Um, poaching in the past was more of an issue. Uh, manatees were protected by the state back into the 50s, but people were still collecting manatees for food. There's so much muscle on manatees that, and it's apparently something that people like to eat. Uh, there was still poaching going on through the 60s. Um, accidental entanglement is something that still occurs because we have, for instance, crab pots down in the Florida Keys. And the lines that connect to the floats that mark those crab pots can sometimes get wrapped around a flipper or a tail or something. And so a number of man manatees have had to be rescued from entanglement. Habitat destruction is reducing the amount of space and forage and other things for them. And then more recently, harmful algal blooms have been significant causes of mortality for manatees. Things like uh, the dinoflagellate Karenia brevis in the southwest Florida produces brevitoxins. That gets in the water and can actually kill manatees. And so in both 1996 and 2013, there were mortalities of over 100 individuals due to just red tides. And so you get this sort of situation. Uh, we had in 2013 over 100 individuals die for reasons that are not quite known in the northern Indian River Lagoon. And so we're rehabbing these individuals and then putting them back in there without necessarily understanding just what actually was causing them such stress. As far as diets go, well, we do call them sea cows, and they are like cows. They're grazing a lot, and uh, they have a very large digestive tract. You look at a manatee, it looks big and blubbery, but actually there's very little body fat on them at all. What it is is musculature and then this enormous gut that has to handle all of the food that they're eating. They're eating typically about 10% their body weight per day. And if it takes seven days for all that vegetation to pass through the gut, then a 1,000 pound manatee may have something like 500 pounds of plant matter being processed in its gut. That's what makes them look so big. They feed on all sorts of plants. Uh, they're major grazers in seagrass beds. They also eat mangrove leaves. Uh, I'll show you images of them either reaching up or just taking uh, debris from the surface. Um, mangrove propules. They'll feed on debris all over the place. And they've also been known to haul themselves out of the water and feed on terrestrial plants like this guy. <laughs> the photographer said that he was really interested in the banana leaves right there. OK, so here we are at Harbor Branch. And Harbor Branch actually started in the 60s as a sand mine. They were sending barges in, piling up sand, and shipping it to the Bahamas. And when Seward Johnson was looking for a place to set up his new oceanographic institution, this one already had a channel for boats. So it seemed like a, a prime location uh, they started up Harbor Branch, and in the 70s, they added the seawalls. And that may have changed conditions for the manatees. There are a lot more observations anecdotally um, in the late 70s and onward. Um, it could be that people just noticed them more, or it could be that more manatees were coming in. Um, it turns out that this area is really important for manatees. Uh, the, Harbor Branch Channel and associated basins and such really provide quiet spaces and a refuge from all the boat traffic in the intracoastal waterway, plus other things, as we'll see. But despite this being an oceanographic institution, but despite manatees being seen all the time since the 70s, nobody actually organized any kind of observation program. 
So this got started in 2009. And the purpose of the project are actually a number of things. One, just how many manatees are here? Who's coming here? Are they residents or are they transient migratory individuals? Um, what sort of behaviors are they exhibiting in Harbor Branch? And what are the environmental correlates? The, you know, is it cold out in the lagoon versus warmer in the uh, channel? Those sorts of things. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey actually has a biological branch, and the Gainesville office actually runs what's known as the Manatee Individual Photo Identification System, better known as MIPS. And MIPS is a whole database of images and, and information on individuals that are recognizable and distinguishable and have been photographed at different places through the years. So once we started this program, we decided to start sharing our images with MIPS. The survey method, we've got two sites here at Harbor Branch where in the morning, uh, volunteers or students go, they do observations for at least 15 minutes because that is the amount of time, the maximum amount of time a manatee can hold its breath. So if you don't see a manatee in 15 minutes, you're pretty assured that there aren't any manatees lurking on the bottom. You record the time, how many adults and subadults versus calves that we see, the distinguishing uh, size between calves and, and adults and subadults is, are they bigger than five feet or less than five feet? The calves would be that year's reproduction. And then the environmental data, behaviors that are seen, and photographing any individuals that we see that have distinctive markings on them. And because the boat strikes are so frequent, many, have some sort of scar patterns on them. Now, in order to do this for MIPS, we have to get both sides, the back and the tail paddle, in combination so that they have all of the different distinctive areas to uh, assess and do the matches with. And so these are just three individuals that in the last, oh, three or four months uh, showed up and have unique scar patterns that actually don't match anything that's already in our database. So here's Harbor Branch looking down, and here are the two sites that we use, one of which is the West Basin here, the very west end of the channel. And this is actually a state-mandated manatee refuge. Going from about here inward, uh, it's a no-entry zone. No boats, no divers in the water, not even a kayak. It's a refuge for the manatees. And the manatees seem to have learned that because they use that space a great deal, and they congregate in this area a lot. So that's one place. The other is the small boats marina. Yes, it is a marina. Yes, there are active boats moving through, but it's not all that frequent. And the boaters here at Harbor Branch are cognizant that there could be manatees in the water. So they're very, very careful about moving through this channel and into the docks or into the boat ramp that's over here. So this program got started in 2009, and it was because of this woman right here. This is Lauren Neese. She was one of my Honors College students who was looking for a thesis project. And she had just finished Semester by the Sea here and decided to go for a summer internship. And she loved the manatees. And she was surprised to find out that no one was actually paying any attention to them, really, seriously. So she talked with Marilyn Mazoil, who happens to do the dolphin photo identification system. And the three of us got together and got this started as a program. Marilyn transported all of the techniques and the database uh, structure from the dolphin photo ID program to start up this brand new manatee photo ID system. Lauren went out and did all of the environmental um, measurements as well as photographing individuals and matching those to individuals uh, that had been photographed previously here at Harbor Branch. And she ended up with about 50 distinctive individuals at the end of her um, internship and then her thesis research. And that was the beginning. We now had at least 50 distinctive individuals that we could recognize as coming into Harbor Branch. And you know the individuals are, are pretty marked. I mean, even if you don't get the full body, 
you can tell like this individual here, this is a T-top or a triceratops tail, who, you know, nobody else has that sort of mutilation to their tail. It's so distinctive. Some of these, like back E here, um, also distinctive enough that even without seeing the tail, you know who that is. And so we were able to track when we were seeing individuals like back E and such returning to Harbor Branch over the years. As far as the photo identification analysis, um, those photos were used and compared to prior photos to make sure that we were matching to individuals who had been um, images of individuals who'd been here before. Uh, this happens to be Claire Robinson, another uh, Link summer intern who then turned her work into the uh, honors thesis at the Honors College. And Claire did a substantial amount of work, I mean, an incredible amount of work, because what she had done was not only some of her own photography, but she had taken data accumulated by volunteers for the prior two or three years and compiled all of that. So some of the research questions that we were dealing with was, you know, are there particular times of the year that manatees are more abundant in Harbor Branch? Um, what about that really harsh freeze we had in 2010, the winter of 2010, 2011, where there was like three weeks of so cold weather that all the snook were dying and all sorts of other tropical fish were washing ashore. Did that really hurt the manatees? And then, you know, what sort of behaviors were the manatees doing as well as is there really a resident population in this area or is everybody just a migrant sort of making their way at different times? So this is our six-year perspective now on abundance of manatees at Harbor Branch. And one of the things that comes out clear is that particularly cold winters, we have lots more manatees in here. Now, the way this is standardized, it doesn't look like a whole lot. And, you know, we reach uh, almost 14 per survey. But very frequently, what we would see is a lot of individuals in the morning. And then when things warmed up in the afternoon, they were moving out into the lagoon. So the numbers were much, much lower in the afternoon. So these really cold winters, we could be seeing as many as 100 animals in the channel. Whereas these warmer winters, such as uh, this year so far, milder winters, it's maybe 10 to 30 individuals in the channel on a cold day. I'm really interested to see what tonight's cold spell and tomorrow's you know, near freeze is going to do. Um, with the transients, there are some that manage to try and stay as far north as they can through the winter. But if it gets really harsh, like it might uh, this week, they all get forced southwards. And so we may end up with one of those big days of 100 in the channel, or it may just end up being one of those 30-day assemblages. As far as you know, where are they showing up most, it's really the West Basin. When Lauren started the project, she had a third site that she was using, but so few manatees were showing up there, we just cut it out. It just wasn't worthwhile surveying because it was mostly resulting in zeros. So West Basin, predominantly where they're going, but quite a number in the small boats and for different reasons, as we'll see. Winter versus summer, yeah, it's all about the winter. Uh, this is a thermal refuge, clearly a place where they're coming to try and stay warm when the rest of the lagoon is getting colder. So what about the behaviors? There's a lot known about behavior in studying manatees in places like Crystal River and at uh, power plants and such. But in a passive thermal basin, not so much. So typically, you know, they're spending a lot of time resting. And then they're also spending a significant amount of time feeding each day. I mean, if you're going to eat 100 pounds of vegetation each day, you're filling your mouth a lot, frequently. Uh, some reports are that they're asynchronous. They're not a day-night wake-sleep cycle. They are basically just catnapping throughout the day and waking up and going out and foraging, whether it's dark or light. This would be really interesting to find out here. 
And they can travel significant distances just in going to foraging grounds in different places. So it's quite possible that we've got manatees that are staying here in the morning to stay warm through the night and then heading off and going to some place like Round Island or somewhere else. We don't actually know where these individuals are going. So that's yet another question that I'd like to address at some point. Uh, typically, once they're out into the lagoon, they're solitary unless it's a cow-calf pair. And those two show a lot of fidelity, stay together a lot. Um, but even a cow will sometimes leave a calf for several minutes and go forage on its own. Um, one of the things about the manatees is even though they've got re really, really thick skin, there's apparently a lot of sensory organs in there because they're very, very tactile. They're touching each other all the time when they're in groups. And so they're, they're bumping each other or using their flipper to sort of encircle another individual or using their mouth to sort of nuzzle. So these are the behavior categories that we established way back in 2009 as a preliminary thing. We didn't understand a lot about the behavior at the time other than what was in the literature. Uh, so we've got surface resting, which is an individual that's sort of bobbing at the surface, typically basking in the sunlight to try and increase their body temperature. Um, and this category is a little problematic. This is called mudding. And according to the literature, mudding is a thermoregulatory behavior where they're rolling themselves in the mud to put another insulative layer on the outside of their body. Problem is that some of the observers were seeing mud washing off of these individuals in the summertime when water temperatures were high enough that they shouldn't have to be doing any sort of thermoregulation. And this past summer when I was doing a lot of the observations myself, the thing I noticed was that there were individuals that were coming up with just mud on their head and their faces. And these are more likely individuals that are rooting around on the bottom, feeding on plant debris lying on the bottom, and they're getting their faces muddy. So they're not mudding in the sense of thermoregulatory. They're foraging, bottom feeding. And those two have been conflated in the past data. And that, that is going to be very hard to tease out because we could potentially say, OK, all the summer mudding is just feeding and all the winter mudding is uh, thermoregulation, except I was out there on New Year's Day. It was 75 degrees. The water was really warm, and everyone was coming up with dirty faces. So they're feeding in the wintertime as well. And how do I tell what kind of behavior they were doing in the past? One thing that we see a lot in the West Basin is drinking. There is a pipe that has uh, fresh water flowing out of it constantly. It's dribbling out, not very su substantially, but it's enough. And these animals have very good memories. They do learn places and remember, for instance, that there is a water fountain in the West Basin that they can access. Now, as mammals, they don't have the kidneys to actually remove excess salt from drinking salt water. So they don't drink salt water. They enter places like estuaries or up into rivers and drink brackish or fresh water. And there are lots of instances of them drinking something like this, or if you go to a marina and somebody's got a hose going into the water, they'll go right up to that and start drinking the hose water. Um, even in the small boats marina, when people are flushing out the, the motors, um, there's a little stream that comes out of that, and manatees will come right up there and just sort of drink it. Traveling is a very directed, rapid movement. And when they're swimming like that, you don't actually see them very much. They're underwater. And instead, what happens is the upstroke of their paddle causes a big eddy at the surface. And so you get these circular eddies, what are known as manatee footprints. And that's clearly an individual that's moving in a particular direction at pretty decent speed. The alternative to this is what's called milling, where individuals are just sort of wandering around. And usually, it's associated with foraging, where they're just sort of, oh, I'll try and eat over here, or let's move over here. And there's nothing really directed to it, nor very rapid. Mating behavior, um, manatees are fairly promiscuous. And so you've got a female who's in estrus and lots of males trying to mate with her. 
And so there's a lot of this kind of contact, but it often gets much more agitated in what we call cavorting as a sort of manatee foreplay. And the cavorting involves thrashing the water and everything. The mating, sometimes females will beach themselves, and the males will follow them right onto the shoreline. Um, symbiosis was a category we had to add because we noticed that in the West Basin, some of the manatees would get close enough to the seawall that fish like sheep's head and such would go over to the manatee and start picking at algae and invertebrates that were on the back of the manatee. And so they're opportunistically feeding, but we considered this a, a kind of symbiosis. Socializing is essentially non-mating, non-cavorting behavior, where it's more sort of gentle uh, nudging or patting or, or nuzzling. And as I said, they're very tactile. This is one way that they communicate with each other is just by touching. Nursing, well, females have one T underneath the armpit of each flipper. And so technically, they could potentially nurse two individuals. Twin calves are very, very rare. So typically, you've got one calf, and it's switching off sides as far as where it nurses. And then feeding. Well, there's all sorts of feeding. There's bottom feeding, and there's uh, surface feeding, and cropping vegetation outside of the water, like this manatee is rising up and actually taking leaves straight off the mangrove tree, and seagrass beds, and all sorts of other things. So this is a graph of the uh, different behaviors. And what we see corresponds with what people have said before, that things like resting are the most abundant. Milling is also very frequent. Uh, drinking and feeding are very abundant. Uh, mating and cavorting are a little exaggerated in this. And that's partly how the data was analyzed, I'm afraid. Um, and mudding, as I said, is problematic. Uh, some of that is actually more bottom feeding, and some of that is thermoregulation. OK, so here's a video. This is top feeding in a manatee, where the wind, when it's coming from the east, very frequently blows plant debris right into the, um, into the channel. And so in the West Basin, we get these accumulations of plant debris. And for a while, it'll be at the surface, and eventually it'll sink to the bottom. And so the individuals that are coming in to either surface feed or bottom feed are taking advantage of all this plant debris. Now, manatees are related to elephants. And like the trunk of an elephant, they have very prehensile portions of their snout. And so they can actually reach out and oops, what happened there? They can reach out with their snout and actually take the food in and direct it towards the mouth, because the mouth is actually further inside. OK. So what about differences between the two different sites? And what we find is uh, mating and cavorting are really popular in the small boats marina. And also socializing and traveling. Well, traveling is no, no surprise, because there is that small channel. And whenever you get um, the motorboat's activity, very often the individuals will leave the basin. Um, as far as the West Basin goes, drinking and symbiotic relations are much more frequent than in the small boats. And then milling, feeding, nursing, bottom and surface resting are really common at both sites. So that's pretty much in keeping with what's been observed in other places. OK, here's another movie. Hopefully this works. This is that water pipe in the West Basin, and individuals coming in to, feed, uh, to drink. But what's funny about this one is that we've got three different manatees here jostling each other. They're, they're like little boys at a drinking fountain, shoving each other over in order to get a drink of water. <laughs> it's just pushing them off. <laughs> Look at that. He's, he's actually pushing off of the oysters and the seawall there to shove this other individual away. 
Now, if I were just scoring this, this would be drinking. But what we've got here is some very interesting behavior because this really big individual is actually acting like a dominant. And the other two are trying to push it off and it keeps like shoving them down. So there's that prehensile snout. And you see how far the mouth is inside. bit of socializing there and then shove them off. Just shove them down into the water. <laughs> yep. And <laughs> So this is drinking, but this is way more interesting than just, you know, saying they were drinking. And you can see with all these sharp oysters around there, having that thick skin is actually very advantageous. Okay. So this is looking at the behaviors uh, in different seasons. And so in the winter time, um, We've got resting and mudding as being common. In the summertime, it's resting, cavorting, and mating being most common. OK, so now to the photo identification part of this. Um, MIPS, the USGS, has a very small staff. There are about five people working on this program. And to make things much more efficient for them, one of the things that they've been doing is going to known manatee aggregation sites in the winter and photographing all the individuals they can. So that optimization means that they're going to certain places and leaving a whole lot of Florida untested and unobserved. They used to actually come here in the mid-1990s on their way to the King Power Plant that used to be in Fort Pierce. There used to be a coal-fired power plant over by the Manatee Center in Fort Pierce on Morse Creek. Um, when that was decommissioned in 2008, the warm water source disappeared. The manatees quickly learned it was not a place to go anymore. And once it was demolished um, in 2008, 2009, that was it. It was no longer an aggregation site. MIPS stopped going to that place a few years prior and also stopped coming here. So today, where they go is uh, the closest place north is up in Melbourne and in Cocoa Beach. There are two power plants. And then the closest place to the south is in Riviera Beach, which means that there's over a 100-mile gap between the two sites on the Atlantic seaboard here that they are missing. And our work with Harbor Branch actually fills that gap to a certain extent. And they've come to appreciate that Harbor Branch is actually an important site for manatees because it is a passive thermal basin and a place where manatees are aggregating in moderately large numbers at times. So here's Riviera Beach. This is what theirs look like. They've got this outfall right there and huge aggregations of manatees in there. Sometimes they're packed wall to wall like this. So that makes it much easier to photo individuals in, and set them up for identifications. It's, I wish the water was this clear in the channel here in Harbor Branch. 
So currently, MIPS has 3,400 different distinctive individuals that they recognize in their database. Now, not all of these are alive. They also photograph carcasses, and they've also noted that individuals that they had previously been photographing have perished at some point in time. But still, 3,400 individuals, that's a significant number. It's a huge database. They have different algorithms that allow them to find individuals and match them um, relatively quickly, but not you know, really light speed. Um, because they've been using photos provided by other investigators as well as photos they've been generating since the late 80s and early 90s, uh, they have long photographic histories for some of these individuals. So what we've done is we've been giving distinctive codes for all the individuals that we see here that have really distinguishable markings on them, whether it's mutilations or scars or what have you. And currently in our database, we have over 330 distinctive individuals that we can recognize. And we've named all of these individuals. And we sent uh, batches of these off to MIPS to see what sort of matches there were. When Lauren Neese did it, she sent off the first 35 or so individuals that she had photographed and could recognize as distinctive and came back with about six matches. And then later on, there were another three or four matches uh, that that were confirmed as well. Um, our latest batch was 210 individuals. And that was such a mass that they're still working through it. That was a group that we sent in uh, April. And so we've actually accumulated more new distinctive individuals since April, but we haven't sent them to MIPS yet because you know it's no use sort of crushing them with data. So there will be more individuals that could potentially match into uh, MIPS. Now, unfortunately, of the individuals we've been tracking since 2009, we can now confirm that nine of them have died. Uh, five of them died in that mass die-off in the Indian River Lagoon in 2013. So here are just some examples of individuals and the distinctive scars and some of the things that these photo records can tell us about the biology of manatees, which is really interesting. So here's Blow. This is a male, first identified by MIPS in 2002, and it was photographed at the Riviera Beach. Uh, this is our four-letter code for this individual. This is the MIPS code. So Riviera Beach 645 is the individual. And this has been seen at, at Harbor Branch several times. And photographing individuals over time means that you can see changes as they occur. So here is the tail in 2009, and you see there's this distinctive mark that allows us to say, oh yeah, that's blow, as well as these accessory marks, and there's one cutout right here in the tail. Two years later, there are additional marks and three cutouts now here. So this individual in a two-year time frame has probably had one or two boat strikes in just the tail paddle in that time frame. So that gives us some handle on actually the rate at which boat strikes are occurring within some of these populations. Here's Drop, has this characteristic teardrop scar. And she was first photographed in MIPS in 1993, another Riviera Beach individual. And Harbor Branch, she regularly comes back. She was seen in March. She'll probably show up on her way north again next month. T-top, I mentioned, you know, this really distinctive tail right here. Um, is a female, first identified in 2001 in MIPS, seen at Riviera Beach, and they thought that she only stayed in Riviera Beach, except for our photos are the first and only documentation of her outside of Riviera. Another thing these photographs can do is provide just basic biological information. There are just a couple ways that you can tell whether a manatee is a male or a female. If she's nursing, okay. Pretty clear, that's a female. But what about the males? How do you tell if it's a male or how do you tell if it's a non-nursing female? Uh, the way you do is that manatees have a genital slit the same way that dolphins do. And the position of the genital slit is down close to the anus in females or up near the belly button in males. So if they roll over on their back and show, your, show their belly, you can take a look at that and say, okay, you're a girl. 
<laughs> Mom W is another manatee. Um, FP stands for Fort Pierce. This is one of the ones that used to hang out at the King plant. And she's been seen at, Riviera's be at Riviera Beach, but more frequently at Moores Creek, which was the outfall for the Fort Pierce plant. And Harbor Branch, we've been seeing her regularly. And Saw, another female, 1983 first seen. So now we're talking about individuals that are over 30 years old now. If we keep doing this in successive decades, maybe we will finally figure out just how old do they get in the wild. And that's one thing that they're doing with the MIPS database, is also looking at mortality due to boat strikes or what have you, and survival rates. So saw comes here frequently, as you can see. Lots and lots of, of different times. Saw shows up with, so here we've got a calf in 2010 and a calf in 2011. And so this is a case where this individual actually had young in successive years. And I said it's on average every other year, but it's actually in reality every one to three years uh, females are producing a new calf. Here's Dash. Uh, this is known as Bonnie in the, both the MIPS and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. FK stands for Florida Keys. This is one of the first ones photographed in the Florida Keys, and that's because she was entangled in a crab pot. And the FWC gets so many calls on her that they call her a serial entangler. She keeps getting tangled up in ropes. <laughs> Most times it's not too damaging, but you see this sort of gouge and groove right there in this one flipper. That makes her very distinctive, and so you can see that and say, oh yeah, that's Bonnie. Um, but that's damage due to a, a uh, rope being tangled very, very tightly around that flipper. And this is Lanny. Lanny is another one that FWC gets a lot of calls on because Lanny sustained some injury several years ago that causes her to float kind of funny. Um, the front part of her body actually floats more out of the water than just the mid-back. And she lists to one side. And listing is especially is considered a sign that you've got a distressed manatee. And a lot of people know that. So they call FWC when they see Lanny. Uh, plus, you see all these scars. She's a warrior. She's been hit so many different times. Um, so FWC gets these calls, and they're like, okay, describe the scars. Is there one right here, one right there, one right there? And people say, yeah, so, okay, that's Lanny. She's fine. Um, and Lanny comes here all the time. I mean, she was here in October. And somebody who didn't know saw Lanny in October and called FWC again. <laughs> And Nikki. Uh, Nikki's a female. We haven't matched her into the um, MIPS yet, although I'm pretty sure that she probably will make a match at some point. She's got a very distinctive belt scar here before the tail and a number of other scars on her. Um, first seen in 2011, and then she's had two calves since then. So again, we're getting information on how frequently these individuals are reproducing. And so those are, you know, calf one, and uh, providing information on survival and growth. So those are just a few examples of the individuals. Like I said, we've got 74 matches and 330 distinctive individuals. So lots of, of interesting manatees. Uh, overall, we saw no significant decline in numbers after the freezes of 2010 and also 2011. So these manatees are appearing to be able to find refuges even when it gets pretty cold. Um, here, there's fewer manatees during the summer months than in the winter, but there's still regular use. One of the things that I saw with uh, doing observations over this past summer was the drinking fountain's really important. And so they'll duck in, take some drinks, and then duck back out into the lagoon. And so the visitations may actually be much briefer, but maybe not nearly as different numerically as uh, the winter visitations. Uh, MIPS has already acknowledged that, that Harbor Branch is now an important site for
for manatee observations. And because we're doing year-round manatee observations, um, they're now getting more information on potential resident populations and individuals that are hanging as opposed to individuals that are just on their migration routes, either north or south. Um, obviously, they're coming into rest. And because of the refuge status of the west end of the, the uh, channel, uh, it is clearly a no-boat zone that provides them safe space where they don't have to worry about things. Um, warmer waters, fresh water source, food, they've got everything they need here, at least for a while. Now, Dr. Richardson and I um, decided when we were sort of handed over management of this program uh, last summer that we would try and increase student participation in this. And so uh, we had 10 volunteers from MOA, which is the Marine and Oceanographic Academy, the Science Magnet High School that's here on the Harbor Branch campus. They came and uh, were working in our lab and helping Dr. Richardson with a number of projects, but also coming out and doing the, um, the manatee observations. So like these three here, they're watching the manatees drinking at the water fountain. <laughs> I think one of them was recording it. We've got four volunteers in the Semester by the Sea uh, undergraduates this year now. And one of them is an intern who's actually helping with some of the data entry and other things. A uh, PhD student, Beth Brady, is dropping hydrophone over the side and listening in on conversations and recording manatee conversations. Yes, manatees make noises. Unlike elephants, which make really low frequency rumblings and things like that, manatees make really high squeaky sounds. They sound like squeaky toys when they're, when they're making their sounds. Um, and there's a lot of conversation between uh, cows and calves. There's a lot of back and forth duetting that they do. Uh, there are other contact calls and other kinds of uh, vocalizations that manatees do. So Beth is setting up a more elaborate array of hydrophones that are eventually going to be four hydrophones in the West Basin here that will allow her to record all the conversations in the entire West Basin and figure out you know, who's saying what. Um, we have one Honors College intern signed up for uh, next summer. And I'm trying to recruit an honors thesis student to, once again, sort of do an update of everything since Claire's work in April of uh, 2014. And we've got lots of other projects in mind. You know, somewhere down the road, it would be really, really nice to do some telemetry studies. Put some tags on individuals, the resident individuals, and find out where locally they're going. Transients, I don't need to know if Lanny is in Biscayne Bay or up in Canaveral. That's, that's OK. <laughs> but the residents, what are the residents doing? and Where are they going? That's what I'd like to find out. So future research, we still have to do a lot of the correlation of the environmental information that was collected. We have uh, data loggers taking temperature at the surface and at the bottom in both West Basin and the um, Small Boats Marina, we also have loggers out at the mouth of the channel and the Lobo station right there that could very well provide us with a lot of information that we can correlate with, you know, is it air temperature that's sending them in? Is it water temperature that's sending them into the refuge? There's a lot of really interesting things that we could take a look at in trying to correlate that stuff. Beth's hydrophones to surveys are going to be very interesting. And we'll add yet another dimension to my presentations. Well, I, you know, you get to listen to the little. <laughs> <laughs> um, reproductive trends. As we get more history for each of these individuals, we can start saying, you know, how frequently, on average, are all the females here at Harbor Branch reproducing? Things like that. Um, the video camera. Right now, there's a video camera that's set up for daytime, high definition imagery of the manatees. And it's got a motion sensor on it. So as soon as something moves, the whole thing swing, swings over and uh, videos that. Right now, that's being streamed up to the Ocean Discovery Center. We have future plans to try, if there's the bandwidth on our connections, our internet connections, to stream that down to a server in Boca and then release it to the World Wide Web. 
So everyone could just sort of click on the manatee cam and watch the manatees here. The latest thing, and a really cool thing, is a second camera that's been set up there that has infrared lenses and infrared light sources. And what we're going to do is do night surveys and see are they asynchronous? Are they actually coming up or feeding at night? Or are they just resting? We'll see. That only was installed like about two weeks ago. So we have virtually no data as of yet uh, to look at. But down the road, that'll be a really cool project too. So there are a lot of people here to thank about this. Um, the Link Foundation funded three summer interns. Uh, we had Lauren Neese, Lydia Moreland from FIT, and Claire Robinson from FAU. Save RC's uh, specialty license plate funded the acquisition of cameras and such to allow us to take the photos. Marilyn Mazoil and Lauren Neese and I started this program, but because Marilyn had all the familiarity with the Dolphin Photo Identification Program, she took the lead and she ported over all of the methodologies to get this started, get the database established and things like that. She's become overwhelmed with all of the dolphin identification work that she's doing. So last summer, she just looked at Dr. Richardson and I and said, here, it's yours now. <laughs> but I really appreciate all the work that she put into establishing this program. Kathy Beck, our contact at MIPS, has been so gracious in accepting all of the data and photos that we've sent and sending us histories of these individuals. So I can tell you, you know, when blow is seen or and such. Um, Bill Stewart. One of the numerous volunteers who helped after Lydia Moreland finished her internship, there was about a two and a half year gap where we had no one uh, amongst the students helping out. And Bill and many other volunteers, Diane Morgan and such, uh, helped so much with collecting data on a regular basis. And this, these are many of the individuals right here. And that was wonderful. It kept the program going during a gap when we had uh, very little student involvement. Uh, MOA volunteers, the ones that we had last summer, many of them have already said they want to do it this summer. And currently, there's a couple of the um, summer, uh, Semester by the Sea students who are doing a lot of photography and data collection as of yet, and uh, a couple more that are coming online. I see you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, any questions? <laughs>